Okay, um, good morning everyone for this morning's uh, Distinguished Webinar Series in AI and Cybersecurity. Uh, today's talk is uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumar, his uh, uh, title Behavioral Biometrics, Its Applications and Challenges. Uh, Dr. Kumar is a tenure-track assistant professor at Bucknell University. He obtained his PhD in Computer Science from Syracuse University. Before his PhD, he received his master's degree in computer applications and applied mathematics from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and Louisiana, Louisiana Tech University, Louisiana, respectively. His research focuses on harnessing the power of behavioral footprints recorded by ubiquitous smart devices and machine intelligence to solve problems in security, privacy, natural language processing, and healthcare domains. Particularly, he focuses on trustworthiness of AI systems in these domains. Dr. Kumar has published 20 plus research articles in reputed conferences, journals, and transactions with an average citation impact of 30 plus. Dr. Kumar, it is a distinct honor to have you as part of uh, hosting this webinar series at UND. Thank you so much for spending your time this morning with us. And the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ranganathan, uh, for that nice introduction. Um, and uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending this. Um, I changed the title a little bit. I was not sure. I think even I'm not still sure that happens. So behavioral biometrics, opportunities, and challenges. I'm going to um, probably introduce biometrics first because a lot of people get confused between biometrics, biomedical, biomechanics, many other things. So maybe we should know what biometrics are before we get into deeper uh, details. And we'll talk about two types of biometrics, physical and behavioral. And I would also talk about why behavioral biometrics are important uh, to study and how the behavioral biometrics-based systems are implemented. It's basically a machine learning pipeline, but we'll go through them specific to the data uh, that I have been dealing with. Um, and then remaining challenges, a lot of I, I think you can call them opportunities as well because those problems are yet to be solved. And then I will also talk about biometrics beyond security because a lot of uh, studies in biometrics field has um, centered around the security problem. Uh, but there are more problems that can be solved, fake profile, health monitoring, customer and consumer intelligence. Talk about them a little bit. So I would start with um, this talk with a quote from Dale Carnegie. Uh, who said that there are four ways and only four ways in which we have contact with this world. We are evaluated and classified by these four contacts. How do we look? What do we do? What we say and how we say it. I'll focus uh, majorly on um, the first two, where how do we look uh, is classified as physical biometrics and whatever we do is classified as behavioral biometrics. Um, so let's talk about biometrics, right? It, the biometrics word actually comes from Bio and bio means life, metrics means measure. So if we are able to measure any kind of live um, artifacts, fingerprints, face, iris, all of these. And there are some other types you can see voice, signature, your walking pattern, which is known as gait. So I'm going to say a gait a lot. Be aware that this is basically walking pattern of individual, which can be collected in so many ways. You can collect people's walking pattern data using video, using sensor uh, built into your smart devices and using pressure plates and many other ways, right? We'll be mostly talking about the sensor-based gate, which, which uh, is recorded by smartphone or smartwatches. So how do we look? Face, fingerprint, iris, and also DNA. DNA is originally used in, um, you know, criminal investigations and so on, but I, I hope that you are already familiar with face, fingerprint. Iris was also launched with one of the Samsung devices in the past. I'm not sure why didn't it take up as um, fast as face and fingerprint. I'll be talking about advantages and disadvantages of uh, fingerprint face um, based technologies that are part of now our life. Um, behavioral biometrics, um, which I am talking about, the examples of that is your walking pattern that can be collected. Repeating it, phone, smartwatch, your voice can be collected and it has a lot of applications in consumer customer service. When you're calling someone and you are telling your social security number, uh, but let's say somebody steals your social security number and they are calling to a customer care device, uh, customer care representative, and they are telling your social security number, but they cannot speak your social security number exactly the same way you speak. 
So the idea is even if they know your social security um, number, they won't be able to say it the way you say it. It's not just about the content, it's about how that content was produced also matters. So your behavior is being kind of added to the, uh, to the process of authentication. Uh, more things uh, recently, I wouldn't say recent, it's been 10 years since this first paper came up on touch stroke, the way you swipe. Uh, and it, it came around the same time as touch devices were becoming popular, where we are trying to scroll, we're trying to swipe through images, pictures, web um, websites, social media accounts, and so on. So a um, couple of research has shown that touch strokes are pretty unique to individual because um, you touch, we touch different parts of screen even if we are using the same application. Different coordinates, we exert different pressure in the beginning, in the end, in the middle. It, it has to do with our finger length, maybe, or you know, um, the way we kind of hold our phone and many other things. Um, similarly, the way you type, typing biometrics, it's called typing pattern, it's also known as keystroke biometrics. It's been studied for more than, I guess, 20, 25 years, and DARPA has been funding this research for since, uh, since probably 15 years or more. I guess. And so um, it basically, when I say keystroke, it's basically when you press your particular key, let's say you're typing North Dakota, then you type N, you type O. So the time you to you hold the key N, the time you take to hop from key N to key O, uh, all of these timings, they can produce unique features. So again, the same thing, what you are typing is important, but how you are typing is also important. Let's assume that you have a sentence of password, you know, something, you know, long password, um, and somebody steals this pa that password, but they won't be able to type the same way you type, exact the same idea that we are trying to add behavioral uh, aspect of that process of typing into the security um, authentication. Um, exactly the same way. So there are many more examples why is eye gaze and many other things have been studied as behavior. But what kind of makes these patterns a biometric in the context of security? So Professor Jan, who is an authority from Michigan State University, he has published a book. He has, I guess, 250K citations, uh, sort of. So he defined like there are some criteria. Um, if, if certain pattern that we produce or certain part of us follow that, those criteria, then we can consider uh, these patterns as a biometric. So one of the criteria he defines is universality. So universality means people who you are people who are going to use your technology based on biometrics, they should all have that pattern. For example, fingerprint, most of us have it. Some unfortunate people may not. And maybe there are some finger cuts and so on for laborers, uh, laborers and so on. So universality, collectability, we should be able to collect. One could think of that fingerprint research has been going on for like last 50 years or more. Um, pattern recognition statistics existed probably on that. But then why didn't it become a part of uh, um, our lives, you know, until 10 years um, before? Because we were not able to collect the fingerprint so easily as we are able to collect it now because the now sensors is built into the phone, right? So similarly, walking pattern, it would be very difficult to collect, but now our uh, smart devices, for example, accelerometer, gyroscope, and many other sensors, touch sensors are built into these devices and they can collect our data. So they can collect our walking pattern too. By the way, you can ask question in between because I don't like that sometimes we miss certain things and all of a sudden we move on to the next thing and um, we don't follow later on. So collectability, uniqueness, um, it should be unique among individuals. If your fingerprint is not unique to you, then there'll be a lot of false accepts. If my fingerprint matches with Professor Ranganathan's fingerprint, I would be able to unlock his phone, um, something like that. So it should be unique. And a lot of research has been done actually on the uniqueness of fingerprint faces and so on. Um, permanence, um, it should not change over time. So for example, our fingerprint doesn't change over time. Even if it changes, there are ways to update the template. So adoptive fingerprint recognition is there, um, but it should not change frequently. That's the idea. User acceptability. So no matter what print, what pattern we are going to use um, for security authentication, we have to, uh, it has to be acceptable to us. Certain part of our body may be more unique than fingerprint, but we may not be comfortable giving the print of that part of our body. So it has to be user acceptable. Circumvention, it should be difficult to spoof fingerprint face or something. We'll talk about how easy it is to spoof fingerprint or face. 
um, or circumvent how AG it is to bypass fingerprint recognition. We'll talk about them a little bit. Performance, um, so it should be fast. Like if, if assume that um, matching two fingerprints, if it was taking a lot of resource, GPUs and so on, you wouldn't be using it. Uh, so it should not consume a lot of resources because we have limited resources and at least on the edge devices that we use. Integration, it should be able to uh, integra uh, integrate it in, in current devices and so on. Whatever you study, it should be easily integrable. If it requires certain unique hardware, then a lot of people are not going to be uh, convinced that, hey, if, if just to identify your um, to verify your identity, if you need extra hardware, probably that's um, uh, a little bit of uh, because it will require it will increase the cost of the devices and so anyway so those are the criteria defined by professor jan um i will get to behavioral biometrics i just mentioned about those right and all of those criteria i mentioned they are also applicable to behavioral biometrics it's not like they are only applicable to uh, physical biometrics so um traditional security tokens you may be aware that um a lot of these I'm just trying to take um okay. So a lot of these pin, password, and pattern you have been using and you have been using in the past, and a lot of us still use it. Um, so they are called knowledge-based, memory-based. We have to memorize them. And then some of them we have been using fingerprint and face, and a lot of application scenarios are there. This picture is actually taken from a paper recently published on trustworthy NASA biometrics. It's called Trust But Verify from Professor Jan himself. So um these are some application scenarios. Uh, let's talk about um, uh, their, you know, usability aspect of how AG2, uh, are they still relevant? Should we still be using them is my question here. So what are the issues with, uh, you know, PIN, PIN-based? What were the issues? I have kind of noted down that they require memorization. Sometimes we forget if it is a long password PIN. You know, there are a lot of PINs that we have to remember nowadays. They are intrusive. So every time you receive a text, hello, hi, how are you coming, going, all of those, just even one word text, you have to enter four digit or six digit of pin on your phone. That becomes inconvenient. And it's intrusive because user has to, you know, enter those tokens every single time that user wants to unlock the phone. It's time consuming, can be stolen, and offer only entry point security. So... This paper we published in 2014, um, which was uh, kind of taken by a lot of news um, venues. Um, we showed that even if somebody is typing their pin, even if you record from the behind, just based on their hand movement pattern, you can infer what particular pin they are typing. And the accuracy was, I was going to show the video, but the talk is a little bit longer. So I would probably refrain. I have shared the, the link so you can actually watch the video, like how it's actually done. Um, but these were the accuracies that we uh, received. Um, we use different types of camera, the phone cameras, um, you know, more powerful camera got us more accuracy. Among 10 guesses, we were able to break 94% um, of the pins, actually. It was, um, yeah, um, it was a research that kind of found a basis. Later on, uh, people worked on similar type of idea and they they kind of broke the pattern as well. You see, pattern-based. Um, later on, that became the basis of this research where you can actually uh, crack and drive pattern lock in five attempts. Similar idea. Um, also, some of you might be wondering that, um, what about the passwords? If, if you have alphanumeric longer password, um, later research in 2021, it also shows showed that with 10 guesses, you can actually crack around 80% of the passwords, depending on how far, how clear the video is. So all I'm trying to say from these slides, um, last three slides are that pin, password, pattern are not as secure as we think. They can be stolen, they are time consuming and so on. So a step forward was taken. We adopted fingerprint in our life, lives, right? Uh, via iPhones. But you can see that, you know, how easy it is to breach um, iPhones. A professor uh, at Johns Hopkins who is expert in security, his son was, when he was sleeping, his son was able to take his iPhone and get his fingerprint and install the, the games that he liked. So so there was this, um, you know, news, iPhone encryption stops FBI, but not this seven-year-old kid. Um, so you can see that how easy it is to bypass fingerprint, right? And also this club in Germany, which is, kind of which test most of the security systems. Uh, they said that as we have said now in more than years, um, 
fingerprints should not be used to secure anything. You leave them everywhere and it is far easy to make fake fingerprint out of the lifted prints. Again, it requires a lot of effort for someone not so expert uh, to lift your fingerprint, create another fingerprint, and then put it on your phone and get it. But if there is a high reward associated with your mobile phone, the data that you have stored on your mobile phone, the passwords that you have stored on your financial websites, if that becomes um, rewarding, then a lot of people might like to do that, right? Might like to um, make that level of effort that is required. So another step forward was facial recognition. Facial recognition came. It is again problematic very recently. This is the news. Somebody developed a t-shirt because most of the facial recognitions are CNN based. And so they developed a t-shirt which can fool CNN based models. And you can see it's um, even very recent research 2022. So it's always a kind of uh, arms race between people who develop security system and people who develop attack, right? It's like red team and green team or blue team call it. And you can see that how uh, since we are adopting facial recognition system across our borders, you can see that how easy it is to fool, um, you know, facial recognition system. So even uh, story of Chinese twins who swapped passports and fooled global airport security checks. Um, so there were two sisters and one sister just took the pass passport of another sister who had all the visas maybe pasted on, on, on her passport and then she was able to travel using that. So if we are adopting all of these biometric system, we have to worry about, uh, you know, this kind of um, loopholes. More than that, you cannot use um, face or fingerprint based systems because let's say there is a security environment where, you know, terrorist uh, attack or maybe army personnel, if terrorist captures army personnel, unfortunately, then they will be able to forcefully take these prints, right? So what stops them from taking that prints? And if you're intoxicated, you're sleeping, they can be taken. So are, they are not as secure as we think. I have kind of listed a variety of limitations of these um, systems. And that's where my question of why behavioral biometrics gets answered. So some of the major limitations, they offer only entry point verification. What do I mean by that? That if you unlock your phone using your fingerprint, it gets unlocked and I can use it. Anybody else can use it. Your phone is not stopping me uh, to use it as long as it's unlocked, right? So it's just entry point. You have security system at entry point. After that, nothing is kind of getting verified. So susceptible to spoof based circumvention. We just talked about spoofing. Intrusion and privacy issues are there. Sometimes facial recognition is associated with privacy issues because you have to have your, your picture is taken and that, you know, in what whatever circumstances you are, um, you might be sick and so on, and that kind of private information gets revealed. Can be taken forcefully or while intoxicated or uh, asleep, unsuitable for high security environment like military, as I told. So what's next? That's my question, what's next? So again, we, we had referred to these patterns that we have access to, and we can use these patterns to provide some sort of uh, you know additional security measures a lot of people try to think about physical biometrics and behavioral biometrics as, as a competitor, but they are not competitor. They can actually, you know, be combined and you can you, you can have a strong entry point verification as well as you can have strong passive continuous second layer of identity verification. So think about this. You unlock your fingerprint and later on when you're using your phone, a lot of pattern that you're producing, touch, zoom, pinch, type, all of these patterns uh, you know, gets used to verify your identity continuously, not just once at the entry point, right? And also you don't have to enter them specifically. All of these patterns are being collected in the background, right? You don't have to enter specifically. And they are considered difficult to spoof. And this is where I have done some, some work where I have been questioning that whether they are actually difficult to spoof or not, because there's not a lot of research that has been done on spoofing behavioral biometrics because it requires tremendous amount of effort. You have to recruit people. You have to say that, hey, you have to copy this person's walking pattern. You have to copy this person's swiping pattern to copy this person's typing pattern. You can think of how difficult of a problem it is. But can it be done? That's the question, right? Also cannot be taken forcefully or while intoxicated or sleep, right? All of these patterns, um, you have to be awake. You have to be working actually on your phone, right? Um, to get this. Um, so research on behavior, be before I move forward, is there any question?
Seeing none, I'll move on. Like what, how do we kind of approach, um, you know, behavioral biometrics research? So these are, again, very standard uh, pipeline of any machine learning um, ML or DL model. You collect a lot of data, you pre-process it, you clean the data. Collection of data requires development of applications like Android app, iOS app, and so on, right? Cleaning of data requires some knowledge of signal processing, depending on what kind of data you're working on. If you're working on time series, gate analysis, and so on, it requires certain different expertise. If you're working on just typing patterns, timings, it requires certain expertise. But all of them nowadays go through, go through ML pipeline, DL pipeline, right? So we engineer features. Um, you know, a lot of feature engineering has happened before the deep learning world took over and data-driven system became kind of state of the art, but they, again, they come up with um, some concerns, which is they require a lot of data to be trained. They require a lot of resources to be trained. And also, um, you know, whether uh, they are explainable or not, can we explain those? And some of these systems we are discussing, they are very, um, critical systems, right? Unless you are able to understand how they are, how the systems are making decisions, uh, you may not be able to deploy them because regulations will chip in. So a lot of feature engineering happens and then training and testing of the model happens. So testing of the model again becomes very difficult because a lot of times people develop these systems and they assume that, um, the, assume non-existence of adversaries. For example, if you're developing a typing pattern based authentication model, um, you will probably collect data from 100 users and um, maybe building authentication model for each user. And then you are assuming that that particular user data is a genuine data and then data coming from rest of the user is imposter data. That's how a lot of system have been trained. Two class problem, you have genuine data, you have imposter data. Imposter data consists of rest of the user, genuine data consists of the user for whom you're building the system, right? So this is what has been done, but um, a, a better way of approaching this would be you recruit more people and then say, hey, could you try to copy this person's pattern, pattern, right? Behavioral pattern. So that has not been done a lot. Again, it, it's a big undertaking. So that's what, attack modeling is an important aspect. Can you design robot to, to do it, right? So performance evaluation, a lot of people have been reporting accuracy, false accepts, false rejects. Um, a lot of people have been reporting the trade-off curve, ROC curve, if you have heard of, you know, uh, binary classification, uh, those are the tools that we have. Um, but some people have also dived into whether the sample size is enough um, and comparison of multiple models, which model is more robust against the attacks, which model is fair among the demographics, which model actually requires a lot of energy to run, right? Environmental impacts, all of these things that I have marked in red, they are still open area of research. So how do we collect the data again? We, the first step is collect the data. We collect the data, um, again, generally you develop an app, you define a scenario where participants come, you get IR, IRB approval, of course, be, because it's a human subject data that you have to collect. And then you get this kind of data. So this picture I like, I created, because these are the things that you, as a user, you do. Uh, for example, you log in, you log in again, all of these things, you scroll and swipe. These are the things that you do, and these are the things that gets collected in the background. These are the swipes, and these are the movement data while you're swiping or typing. And these are the typing data. And these are the value of typing. Your phone is also producing some, some sort of micro movement. And those micro movements get recorded via accelerometer and gyroscopes. So you can see that even sometimes multiple modalities are available, right? So um, for example, typing and phone movements are available at the same time. Swiping and phone movements are available at the same time. So you can actually fuse them. You can have a better you know, recognition accuracy. So this is the data kind of data that we collect and we use, right? What do we do with that data then? We basically do the same thing that other people do. And this is an example that I take from real life. Let's say you go to a restaurant, you order some sort of smoothie, right? Three types of smoothies are available, Del Monto, Veggie Veggie, V4. And then they kind of test different. But the problem is that you have to teach computer how to classify between these smoothies. Um, so this is the question that let's say I ask these smoothie steps different, which is why they are named different, how to teach it to computer to differentiate between them. 
So let's say these are three different patterns uh, from three different users, how to teach computer to basically distinguish or differentiate between those patterns, right? So, well, you could say that I will try to see what kind of vegetables have been used, but it turned out that same type of vegetables have been used to make all of these three smoothies. So we cannot definitely distinguish them based on the type of vegetable that have been used. So what do we do after that? We basically go a little deeper, more micro level, we try to transform this vegetable data um, based on uh, the, con the, the, the amount of um, those vegetables that have been put. So you can see that the amount of vegetables that have been put here, tomato has like some sort of 1.3 ounce and then carrot probably less than 1.3 ounce and so on. So this is Del Monto, this is V4, this is Veggie Veggie. You can see that just based on tomato, you can differentiate them, right? So we call them features. A lot of time, these signals may not seem as distinct, distinguishable when you plot them at data level, but when you extract features out of it, they become distinguishable. That's the idea that I want to convey from this slide, right? Um, similar thing we did, we do with like sign, actual signals, biometric signals. So here is, you have this time series signal, right? This is actually accelerometer, acceleration in X dimension, Y dimension, and G dimension. Your phone has three dimensions. So the vertical is Y, the horizontal is X, and then the thickness of the phone is G direction. And if you put the your phone on the table, um, the G direction acceleration will be 9.8 meter per second square, right? The gravity. Um, so you could understand how it is. So you can actually break down these signals into multiple signals using Fourier transform. It's considered one of the biggest invention of any signal is made of a lot of sine waves, right? So you can break them down and then you can see the amplitude and frequency. Even beyond that, you can just find some statistical features, right? I call them time domains. So frequency domain, time domain, information theory domain, a lot of domains have been tried to classify time series. It's a classical time series classification problem. But I also wanted to let you know that if you're dealing with time series data in your research, these are some of the resources that are available for you to actually refer to. There's a package TSFS is actually extract 7, 6, 746 or something features from one time series signal, which is very interesting. So you don't have to write a lot of code. It's already, but when I was doing this research, it was not available. Now it is available and more kind of established now. So you can use that to extract a lot of features. Um, and it kind of consists of all of the domains that I could think of. And this kind of features that uh, we extract from our swiping patterns, uh, you can see that uh, you have initial you have, a, you have a tuple of four points, X, Y are the coordinates of your finger, the pressure exerted by your finger, the area means how big of your finger is. If bigger finger, then bigger area will be touched on the screen and then the time, right? So you have, and you can see this kind of gestures on your phone. If you go to developer mode and you can say, show me my touch gestures, and if you try to touch this kind of things will get produced when you are swiping, this kind of gestures will get produced. And for every point that is getting produced, for every point you have these tuples, right? So using these tuples, you can actually extract initial, you know, quadrant, um, maybe final quadrant of pressure area and angle, many other things, right? Um, you know, direct distance and so on. All of these features you can use to um, extract uh, and classify swiping gestures among individuals. I'm just giving you some examples from how we extract features from these behavioral biometric signals, right? You can find uh, a deep learning based model that extracts all type of feature automatically, but these are, uh, you know, manually engineered features that people have been using and they've worked really well in the past. So some of the typing features I have already mentioned, the key hold time, the key interval time, the word latency, um, and very recently people have used a uh, number of revisions you make uh, when you type something, how many times you go to delete button, how many times, you know, backspace and all of those. And also um, linguistic features, like do you use proper part of speech, grammar problem, because it should be able to distinguish between at least non-native and native speakers. Here we are talking into like hundred of dimensions and then we are trying to classify a lot of individuals. So the more features you have um, and those powerful, uh, the, the more powerful those features are, the easier it will be for you to distinguish different types of um, individuals, right? 
So this is the idea of feature extraction. And if you're building an authentication model that I have explained earlier, um, you may have to do feature analysis based on two class problems. We did that and we realized that um, for different users, different features were ranked differently. So this slide is actually explaining that, that we had FFTC means Fourier transform standard deviation X was ranked the highest. And then mean absolute change was ranked the highest for this user, user one, user 12 and so on. So I just took three user sample to show you that even if you're selecting top, top 30 features um, based on mutual information calculated between the class label and the features, so this is, this is let's say your um, features and then this is your class label and you can calculate the mutual information, right? And then you can rank these features based on the mutual information. The higher the mutual information, the more uh, feature knows about the class label. So it means that feature is more important. So you can do feature ranking. It's, it's you know, um, classical ML thing. Um, but after that, I we also tried to think, uh, try to see whether these mutual information were actually telling us the right thing. So we we just did KD kernel density estimation plot to figure out that whether uh, the distribution of these feature values um, across the genuine and imposter samples were um, overlapping or not overlapping. What we wanted is they should not be overlapping. That's where uh, you know you are you will be able to distinguish when you train machine learning model on these features you are going to be able to uh, get better results if they are not overlapping. So these are some user samples like we try to plot and then we saw that there are clear cut distinguishability in some of the features. And for some of the features there is overlap, but again, machine learning algorithms will figure it out which feature has to be assigned lesser weight or more weight. Also the authentication problem can be solved in two ways. One way is this two class approach, another is one class approach. So we have a lot of multi-class classification algorithms, right? ML models. I'm not talking about DL models yet because I think I already mentioned you that they require a lot of data. And one of the challenges of this field, studying behavioral biometric is collecting data sets. Um, and for example, if I invite you to, to give me your walking pattern, you might be able to walk for two minutes or three minutes. Um, but you know, if I collect your walking pattern data in all possible context of walking, then it might be very difficult to deal with that kind of data. So there are challenges which we can discuss later. But these two class classification approach is basically you take the user's data for, for whom you're building the model and you take rest of the user's data, you train the classification algorithm, right? You can see that, you know, red or blue, these are genuine. And then these models are able to distinguish between them different models at different, you know, hyperparameters. Um, there is one more approach um, that we studied, which was um, one class classification. So one class classification, uh, the advantage of using one class classification, which is basically clustering, uh, if you'll go to the details, but one class SVM is kind of quite popular in um, in um, what outlier detection um, or maybe what they call it in network, um, network outlier detection traffic and so on. So they have been used a lot. Um, so we tried to use them as, um, so we tried to just give these classifiers genuine data. We did not give them the imposter data and we asked those classifiers um, later on during testing time, we supplied genuine data and we asked them whether this is genuine or not. And then we also supplied non-genuine data, imposter data, and we said whether this is imposter or not, and it was able to classify. The advantage of using one class classifier is um, that you don't need to use data from rest of the users, right? Because that might be, private data and maybe in future we will have a some sort of policy, um, data privacy policy where you are not allowed to use data of other users to train a model of you know some users, right? Uh, so that's why this we, we did this research and it was picked up um, later on. Um, um, but the problem was with one class, class classifier was they were you know less accurate than two class classification. It's like if you know only good in life, you're able to classify good better, but then if you know good and bad both, then you'll be able to classify better, something like that, if that helps you relate. Um, so these are the performance metrics we used, but there are more, many more available. FRR, FAR. FRR basically is when you give your fingerprint to your phone, and if your phone says it's not you, although it's you, when your phone says that it's not you, sometimes it happens to us, our finger is wet, Dirty or something like that, and our phone refuses to to accept our fingerprint as a genuine fingerprint, and that particular error is called false reject rate. 
And if somebody else actually tries their fingerprint on your phone and they are able to unlock your phone, that's called false accept rate. Um, so that's FAR and FRRR. There's something called half total error rate, um, which is basically the average of these two. We require these kind of single point metrics so we can compare two different algorithms, two different biometrics, two different systems, basically. It would be difficult for us to compare if, if a system one has like 8% error rate and if system two had 4% uh, FRR, here, let's say this situation, right? If system one has 8% FAR and 4% FRR, and if system two has, let's say 7%, um, and then, okay, uh, what should I, 5%, which one will you prefer? Will you prefer system one or system two, right? So we need a single point metric, so we are able to compare between that. So maybe, here, they are almost equal, right? 12 by 2 is 6%. And here, 7 by 7 point, what? It's also 6%, right? Average. So you can see that at, at this particular, for this particular example, they were the same. But what would happen if you have 6 or 5, right? Will you just choose this one or that one? So this will be 5.5. So again, we just use that just to be able to compare systems more easily. Um, but it will depend on what kind of, application scenario that you are considering, right? If it is a very high security application scenario, then you don't want any false accepts, right? But if it is a low, it's a civilian application, for example, your own phone or something like that, you, you, can, you can accept high false rejects. So it just depends on application scenarios. And one of the reasons we also present uh, a trade-off curve between FAR and FRR, we present a trade-off curve, right? So if FRR, if you have a civilian applications, the higher it is acceptable. If you have military applications, it has to be lower or something like that, high security applications. So this is a trade-off curve that we generally present whenever we do behavioral biometrics or biometric studies. So moving forward, um, I have some results that one of, from one of the papers that I cited, but there are many more results. You can go through those, those papers. I just wanted to show the curve and then also what kind of numbers we get right across so here I have been, I have compared and um, here and so half total error rate for different type of classifiers, you can see, and the best we have gotten is probably 6.65 .6 here. For phone uh, accelerometer based gate, for watch accelerometer based gate, you can see, and then the lowest we have gotten here is 5.75 and so on. Um, similarly, STR, again, I'm just using STR here to compare. And this is, just a moment, I think. Um, so you have swiping and phone movement patterns. Here you have about, um, I think this is the best, right? So 8.94 error rate. And this is the curve that you can see, and this is called uh, equal error rate, where both of them become same. FAR and FRR become same. This is called equal error rate point. Right, a lot of research you will read in this field, they also report this point because they think that um, this point is basically agnostic to the application scenarios, but it's a good idea to present the entire curve instead of just presenting ER. Um, so you can see that uh, most of the error rates are around 10% or you know below 10%, five to 10%, you can see. But these are one class classifiers, right? One class classifiers were kind of not able to match so much. Um, the best one we have is 10.8%. Even the fusion is around 10.89 when we fused all of these classifiers. Um, you have again 11%, which is, you know, drastically. Uh, so again, this has a certain advantage. Uh, this has a certain disadvantage that you need to have data from other users. Here, you don't have to have data from other users. Um, we have not tested yet uh, whether which one is more robust. Are these one classifier? class classifiers more robust compared to the multi-class classifiers in the environment of attack. If somebody attacks these systems, then which, which particular um, you know, classification algorithm is able to, to defend itself from the attack, right? That part is not yet tested. So that's an open problem if somebody wants to take it up. Um, I think that's uh, the thing that I tried to uh, cover that. And then I'm going to talk about remaining challenges and I'm going to be, um, talking a little fast here. Uh, we These are the challenges. Availability of large public data set is a challenge. Trustworthiness, performance in the wild. Some of these systems that we have tested, 
the data was collected in a lab setting and we would like um, these kind of models and systems to be tested on, on data collected in the wild. Uh, security deception. I've, I've studied security of gate, security of touch biometrics, but security of these biometrics has to be studied that if somebody wants to try to deceive or fool these systems, how um, easily they can do. we can do it. Privacy, and a lot of regulations coming up. So what kind of information behavioral biometric data reveal? Can behavioral biometric tell about your age, your gender, your medical condition, um, so if, if that's the case, then we have to encrypt these behavioral biometric data. Bias and fairness. So you may have read the article, facial recognition systems, speaker verification systems are biased. The question again comes, are behavioral biometric system biased too? Explainability and interpretability of these systems are really important. It's very close. I can give you an example. Uh, uh, I'm from a village in India and my father went to, to get Rasan from the Russian shop, uh, shop, right? And uh, his fingerprint didn't match. So he was denied uh, Russian there. Um, uh, and then I was, when I heard, I was like, well, I'm working on these systems. And um, so the, the Russian person did not explain, the distributor did not explain it to him. Why didn't it work? Can you go and wash your fingerprint, come back and maybe it will work or something like that. Um, so it would, uh, you know, you need um, the, the machine learning um, systems to explain themselves that why did they make the decision that they made. User acceptability, not a lot of studies have been done on whether uh, it will be acceptable, behavioral biometric based system will be acceptable to um, a lot of users. Um, but this particular one study that was done in 2018, it, it actually concludes that most of the people uh, you know, felt uh, happy to adopt uh, behavioral biometrics because it's not intrusive and it's being collected in the background. Maybe it affects their battery, phone battery, but if the phone battery is better, then they're fine with it, sort of. Um, again, deception, I've worked on deception. I'm not, there were videos and so on. I'm going to just tell you that I was able to deceive gate recognition using treadmill, where you can train a person to walk like someone else. There are a lot of studies since 2006 been done and mostly said that uh, it's very difficult to spoof sensor-based gate, um, but in 2015 and 2021, we published two papers where we were able to say that you can actually uh, use treadmill plus uh, uh, to train an individual to produce the same signal as somebody else and you can deceive that. Um, so methods we used, you can go through and read, and these systems were actually able to deceive with very high error rate, you can see here. Uh, we were able to get to like 28% error rate from 2% or something, right? So this is baseline and this is uh, the error rate. These are the baselines for these models and these are after the attack that we were able to improve the error rate, false accept basically. And that's um, kind of alarming, but it took a lot of effort. Uh, the debunk, the concept that it cannot be done, it can be done, but it requires a lot of effort, right? That was the idea. And also very recently a paper we published was dictionary attack. Uh, idea was pretty similar to dictionary based uh, attack on password. So if you have six letter password and all of them are cap capital cases, we have 26 letters and you can generate 26 to power five passwords and you can start matching. Somewhere you'll find the password, right? Something like that. So here we, I tried to develop, um, you know, dictionary of gate passwords. Basically we recruited nine different individuals with different height, with different weight, with different waist, with different A's. And then we try to collect their data at different walking speed, different step length, different step width, and so on. And we created a dictionary. Uh, and whether, so the idea was to find someone closest to your walking pattern and use their pattern to break your, break your gate pattern. And the idea was that that person will be able to walk at that particular setting and will be able to produce the, the signals like you do. Um, so it was well received. Again, dictionary attack was even, um, you know, more effective. You can see 53% here on the right side, um, more effective. This is baseline and this is attack FAR. So we did um, some work on deception and we showed that it's kind of possible. This is another, probably Professor Ranganathan would like it. He has um, used Lego to teach something. So we we actually use Lego to, um, to uh, you know, produce swipes like humans. So if some of your swipes are stolen and we give it to the robot, robot will be able to swipe. And we were able to show that, you know, swipe produced by the robot can match individual swipes that you are trying to attack or, you know, open the phone off. 
So another work that we did uh, was interesting. So the, the summary is that if you, you know, alone, we cannot copy someone, but if you combine human plus machine effort, it can be done. NIST actually introduced effort as a measure of, you know, attackability of any system, security system. And I recently studied uh, deep generative models where we are trying to generate a lot of behavioral biometric data and use that data to train the models, retrain the models that we already have trained. And they are kind of robust to some of these attacks, which is very interesting development. Uh, a lot of work to be done. In that privacy issues, I told you that, you know, what kind of data can be revealed. We studied that keystroke can reveal your gender and you know age. Um, Similarly, fairness. So there are some slides on facial recognition are biased. They are more accurate for um, uh, not people of color, but they're less accurate for you know darker female uh, group. And here it is. You know you must have used these smart speakers. They are not as accurate for uh, for all the demographics, right? Um, so biasness and bias and fairness has to be studied for behavioral biometric as well. Um, we studied it for touch biometrics, and it turned out to be that touch biometrics are not unfair among different uh, genders, but a larger study need to be conducted for rest of the demographics that we have. Explainability, uh, the system needs to be explainable. I haven't worked on it, but this is an open problem, like whether we are able to. One of the reasons that I've been using this classical ML algorithms that they are more explainable than deep learning algorithms, although some people can argue that CNN, we have grad cam and many other ways of you know explaining the CNN based pipeline. Uh, I haven't gotten into that, but I would be happy to take up that kind of um, you know work in the future if somebody's interested. Uh, biometrics beyond security, how many minutes I have? Okay, I've already gone. So if I have two more minutes, am I allowed so I can complete some of these slides? Uh, Jamison, can I keep going? Yep, you go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, so we have um, this, you know, beyond a lot of these patterns have been studied in the context of security, but I wanted to study, uh, you know, I wanted to use these patterns because now we are able to collect them and we have them available um, easily. So uh, what kind of other problems they can solve? We recently published a paper that you could actually detect fake profiles on social media. Um, for example, uh, I will like to give this example where a professor was um, impersonating um, someone. Um, uh, an immigrant woman in STEM program. And he had like 13,000 followers on that fake profile account that he had. And he was posting a lot of nasty things about the EI activities, identity politics, and so on, affecting 13,000 followers and so on. Later on, it was found that he had his own profile and he also had another profile. So he was caught and probably had, had to leave the university. Um, uh, this kind of news caught my attention. So that's where we started working on this problem that since he was the person who was typing on both accounts, the typing pattern across his posts will be same. Also, you may have heard of this, uh, that Elon Musk tried to verify Twitter accounts, uh, blue tick, right? So someone uh, actually created a fake account named some CEO and then posted that we are excited to announce that insulin is free. The stock uh, prices for that particular insulin company started falling. Um, and since that person had gotten his account verified by paying seven bucks or eight bucks, I exactly forgot how much money it costed to verify your account. So even, you know, somebody kind of impersonated and it caused a havoc in the stock market. Uh, the idea is that that person could have been easily verified or not verified based on their keystroke profile, right? Whether that person's, the fake account uh, had the same typing pattern as of the actual person who could have made this announcement if it was accurate. Um, so accuracy is good, but again, we had only 24, 25 users of data. We need more data. We need to collect a lot of data to actually, because we are going to deploy it on billions of users, which uh, is a lot, right? Um, health monitoring, you can monitor stress by using you know, facial recognition, facial cues. Uh, you can also monitor um, you know, seizure attacks, epileptic seizure attacks and so on. If you have a smartwatch and then it vibrates in a certain way, it means that person is getting seizure. Um, Parkinson's disease can be monitored because behavioral signals are being produced almost all the time. Fall detection is another problem that you can solve using uh, accelerometer and gyroscope in your phone. I consider them behavioral biometric. There are many more problems. Dr. Kumar, 
Mm -hmm. Can I uh, can we wrap this in another one or two minutes? Yeah, 30 seconds yeah. almost. So yeah, we also use this for NLP tasks, um, improving the NLP task where we have sentiment and sarcasm detection. This is the conclusion where I'm saying that physical and behavioral biometrics are a fascinating area of research and open store for solving problems in the domain of security, forensic healthcare more effectively. And there exist several challenges which I've already mentioned, the data set performance in the wild, uh, privacy bias and explainability. But it requires a lot of interdisciplinary expertise um, because we're getting data and dom we need dom domain expertise and so on. For example, why did this uh, you know bias in facial recognition system exist in first place? If somebody was there in the particular team which was developing these systems, questioned those systems early on, then those problems wouldn't exist um, in the first place. These were sponsors of some of these research in the past during my PhD. And um, they are to look for. These are my students who I have worked with mostly undergraduates, my advisors and collaborators, and thank you and questions. Sorry, I took five, six more minutes, but it was a long thing to thank you for your presentation, Dr. Kumar. Now we can take QA. Let's see if we have seen any QA questions. Dr. Utkras one. Okay. Um so we have a question from uh, Dr. Utku Jose. Uh, what if AI-based system can create manipulative data mimicking behavior for a person or some people? Should be should be developments more for defensive AI-based systems and for more regulations, maybe? Yeah, um, so this is a great question because, uh, and this is very um, contemporary because we recently have a lot of things being generated by machines. So if, if machine can generate content, it can also generate uh, behavior, right? Behavioral pattern data. So I think um, both, um, I like this triple E model of solving problem, any problem. Triple E is engineering, education, and enforcement, right? So we'll try to solve this problem using engineering. We'll try to generate a lot of data by ourselves and then try to fit it to the machine learning models, AI systems, and then see if they're able to distinguish maybe retrain those models that these are generated data and these are real data. And then whether those models are able to distinguish between those two generated and real data or not, uh, right? Uh, very recently, Signature Biometrics is, is uh, one of the interests of my students and he's exactly studying that, that whether signatures generated by these you know deep generative models are being accepted. Um, enforcement, yeah, you have to bring policies, right? People can't do it if they do it. There are a lot of things that we have stopped that way. Um, education, you educate people to kind of distinguish between what is generated, what is not generated. Um, at least I am able to differentiate between chat GPT generated images and not chat GPT generated images and so on. So yes, that's a great question, but it's very open-ended question, I would say. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, how would the models be able to adapt to changing types of behavior habits? Great. Um, so this is this question uh, has been asked a couple of times. Uh, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, that there are adaptive ML models you can apply, but then it opens door for uh, some sort of attack called frog boiling attack. I cannot say that system will keep learning continuously based on your typing pattern. Um, it can, depending on, so you may have to retrain the model at certain interval, and it has to do with the permanence criteria that I talked about, but your typing pattern doesn't change often, but if it actually changes after a certain threshold, then you need to provide more data and then authenticate yourself, right? And if it stops, yeah. So that would be the case that, yeah, you need to retrain the model or be adaptive uh, mm -hmm. in these changes. Okay, and then Dr. Liu asked, uh, what's the scalability to a large number of samples? Yeah, that um, we have, you know, even fingerprint, people don't claim that it's actually unique because very recently, I think there were studies where fingerprints prints, and faces are not as unique as they were thought to be. So um, I think uh, we just need more data to, to test that, uh, you know, this hypothesis, whether they are scalable to a large scale data or not. We don't have enough data. 
one thing we can do is we can basically generate, but I it's like synthetic data and I don't like working with synthetic data uh, because you know your model may work very well on synthetic data, but later on when you deploy them in the wild, it becomes really difficult. So I would say that they, they might, they are scalable, but whether they will be that accurate as we have reported, um, it's not, it will not be that accurate. But the thing is we are looking for continuous verification. We are not looking for 99% accuracy um, for these systems. Even if these systems are like 60, 70% accurate would be okay. 70% uh, accurate because let's say you are taking a defensive driving course and, and that course of, of offering an entity wants you to verify your identity. It is you who is taking the course. As long as they have 70, 80% confidence that you are taking the course, I think they'll be fine with it. So it depends like what kind of application scenarios we are looking at. Okay, um, you you kind of got into it, but the next question was uh, how uniqueness is ensured. Is there any theoretical foundation ensuring uniqueness and differentiating a large number of entities? Um, so there is uh, not, the answer is there is not a theoretical, um, um, yeah. So you just took the question away, but I, I probably have to go to the answer. When to how is me. uniqueness ensured? <laughs> <laughs> Inserting the uniqueness and differentiating laws. Okay, laws. Um, I think one can compute the entropy of of these patterns, and then actually figure out that how many. It's like facial recognition, right? We have probably one twenty eight um, values at the end when it gets extracted using you know bypassing it through the CNN um, DNN architectures. You get one twenty eight values, and those one twenty eight values are basically in certain range. And you can calculate the entropy of that across the data set and figure out. So I don't think that theoretical proof is possible. Um, but again, these are experimental and applied studies. Um, so I would say that unless we have large amount of representative data set, it's the same problem. It's like sampling and then using those samples to come up with certain uh, type of uh, theoretical foundation or proof to say that they will actually work. And again, it doesn't have to be completely unique. So I have to be saying that even if uh, my fingerprint is not so unique here, uh, nobody is going to try eight point, uh, you know, 7.9 billion fingerprint against my fingerprint. As long as it is unique um, among the people that I live in, among the geographic location that I live in, I should still be okay or something like that. Like I'm not, I don't want to make that claim, but I'm saying that it doesn't have to be completely unique, even if it matches with one or two people uh, on the planet, it's okay. Uh, for example, twins, right? They were able to, you know, you can unlock your, your brother's or sister's phone based on your facial features. Um, but how many twins we have? Not a lot of them there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. I think uh, we're gonna wrap the webinar now. Can you turn on the video? I appreciate for... Uh taking your time this morning with us and uh, and you'll be receiving the plaque from UND for, uh, for your time and look forward to you know uh, collaborate and, and, and have future conversations on uh, how um, we can take this on forward. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone attending. Um, I hope you got something out of it. <laughs> have a very nice day. Yeah, thank you.